Hi, you're listening to Conversations with Musicians with Leia Roseman. The internationally renowned guitarist Derek Gripper is famous for his groundbreaking technique for evoking the West African Kora on the guitar. During this episode, you'll get to hear Derek play quite a bit. Do check out the timestamps. And you'll hear his wonderful insights on how we listen to and learn music, the influence of Montessori and Alexander technique in his life, his reflections on important collaborations in his career, and his perspectives on changes that have been imposed on creators and performers. Please share this episode with your friends, review this podcast, and follow this series either on YouTube or your favorite podcast player. All of these will help new listeners discover Derek Gripper, as well as the other inspiring musicians who are featured, and gain new insights on how much breadth and depth there can be to a life in music. Derek Gripper, thanks so much for joining me today. Yeah, thank you for having me, Lee. I I, um, heard you by chance when you were on tour recently in Canada, and I'm not a person who listens to guitar music, but then I just dove into your discography and I've so enjoyed all, all your creations, you know, I, and I, I kind of went from the beginning and I just listened through your progression as a, as an artist. And um, it's been a fascinating journey actually. So many of, of uh, my listeners won't be familiar with you. Some of them may be fans. Um, and I want to dive into quite a few topics, but I know you're willing to share some music. Did you want to start by playing or you want to start by talking? Oh, playing. Playing is nice. Okay, let's play. Well, I have a guitar here. And what I actually was doing this morning was recording part of a Bach project that I've been busy doing. Um, I've been looking, re-looking at the, uh, the Bach uh, cello suites. And, and what I've been doing, uh, part of it, I, I recorded in two ways. One, I went up into the mountains and I have a reel-to-reel uh, recorder, um, which is really makes beautiful sounds. So what I've been doing, one of the things um, as part of the project that I've been doing is, is playing and learning Bach using a tempura or the, the drone from Indian music. So this kind of thing. slowly we'll make our way back so you kind of get a sense of of the journey that's being made you know the harmonic journey in kind of a quite a beautiful way uh, maybe I, I i'm i'm not yet sure about you know if it's if it's my process or if it's something i put on record or not yeah that's, that's what i'm busy doing beautiful beautiful <laughs> phrasing this is interesting because when you were 19 you had an opportunity to go study carnatic violin for a little bit hmm yeah big mistake <laughs> <laughs> who knew who knew no it wasn't it was a wonderful experience uh i went back a few times but uh, i very quickly learned that uh south india they have the violin sorted it's fine the violin is in good hands and i left sure that i was going to become a guitarist mm-hmm. <laughs> so that's that was mostly the the, the repercussion. And then I went back uh, a few years later and spent a, uh, about six months studying the rhythmic theory, which which was wonderful. Yeah, I really enjoyed your um, recording with a tabla player. Uh, remind me of Uday Muslim Dar. Yes, beautiful. Yeah. I love that recording very much. Oh, yeah, that was so long ago. And it was, it was a live concert. And, um, you know, we were still, we didn't have the greatest you know, technology to capture things. And 
I actually, <laughs> I got that off that, that record we, we recorded and the best mix down was an MP4 that someone had sent me as a reference. <laughs> and I, but there was some, the, the tabla was, was going a little bit into the red and I went through the whole record and I just put a volume dip on each tabla hit that was a little bit too high instead of using a blanket compressor. You know, I was so like, no ways am I going to use this thing. <laughs> so that was yes. a long time ago. Hmm. I've had to do that for some podcast episodes, actually, with my oh, yeah. ru rudimentary <laughs> editing skills. I um, I interviewed a Carnatic violinist uh, last year on the series, uh, Supadra Vijay Kumar. And I remember she was saying in their style of music, there's, she said, there's no concept of rehearsal. And mm -hmm. you've done quite a few collaborations with Indian musicians. But of course, in that time, you had your whole exploration of, of um, Kora music. So coming from your classical background, I'm curious, like getting off the page and, you know what I mean, learning to improvise. How, do, how was that journey for you as a creative musician? I mean, I'm still really a classical musician. I'm not, I'm not the greatest of improvisers in the improvising sense, you know, like a you know, like what well, improvising is such a strange term because, you know, uh, we think of it because of how it's been handed down through jazz, this idea of improvisation in jazz and composition on the spot, Keith Jarrett coming on, on stage with his piano and making up something as he goes along. Um, whereas, you know, when you come across it in Indian classical music, maybe even flamenco, certainly in uh, the manding music, West Africa it's a very different kettle of fish really and I'd say I'm veering more towards this kind of improvisation which is more a, a sort of structural improvisation where you you know you have a repertoire of fragments and parts and pieces and you put them together in in different ways so you never play the piece the same way or with Bach you've got an improvisation of nuance you know you can yeah. I mean Bach takes anything it's so resilient you can do anything to Bach <laughs> and he can kind of hold up um and so as a result it's the most free place to to play music you know Bach's music because you can really you can really bend things do anything you know you can explore chora phrasing on the Bach you know, on Bach you know if you hear chora music and you think wow I'd love to try that you know you just pick up a piece of Bach and play it like the chora and you know, so that's that's what improvisation is for me. It's like the improvisation of nuance and the improvisation of form, and sometimes also in the sort of more Jarrett uh, style as well. Every now and again, that happens. Well, I have to disagree with you about your level of improvisation. I mean, I've heard some of your free improvisations are amazing, and actually, I was curious about specifically. Oh, what was it? Oh, Cedarberg. I think, and Billy goes to Durban, where you said, you ah, just, yeah. you, and Alexander technique would be wonderful to talk about as well. I studied it as well at a certain point. Oh, wow. Yeah. Well, the Cedarburg, I've just got back from there again. It's a friend of mine has this place up in the mountain and it's, you can be there for days and you don't see another human and they incredible mountains, the Cedarburg mountains, they go forever and they're just beautiful. Uh, I just had a conversation on the phone with a Alexander technique teacher called Barry Cantor in Cape Town and we'd been talking about creating spaces you know in between things just to pause you know I mean that's totally Alexander <laughs> you know just to pause and wait you know the stimulus comes you wait and we'd had a kind of really interesting conversation about that which I've now completely forgotten but what I came away with that was I had these microphones set up and I came with the guitar and I sat down and it's beautiful out there on the, you know, just outside on the veranda and there's a little fountain that's running and there's quite a lot of frogs usually. And I played one phrase and I waited. And then I played another phrase and I waited and I did this for a very long time, <laughs> like an hour or so. And then I took away afterwards all the gaps and that's the piece. And it was quite a cool way to compose actually. And I'm so pleased you reminded me of that because I'd forgotten that that was the process and that was, that was how, I'd, how I'd done it because then I listened back 
and I, recently to it. I was like, wow, I really like that piece. <laughs> I really like that piece. And I'd forgotten that it wasn't just improvised. It was improvised with Alexander space. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And as a guitarist, Alexander Technique must have influenced you so much in the way you approach your instrument, the way you sit. Did you mm. come to that from a place of pain or just curiosity? Originally pain. Uh, I managed to debilitate myself quite well by even the age of 19, 20. I, mm. my, my elbow wasn't straightening too well and I got really a lot of pain in the back. So I did, started working with uh, an Alexander Technique teacher. And that was kind of a, a light bulb. Wow. Okay. This is, uh, this is interesting. This is what can, this is what's possible. Um, and then I explored lots of, lots of different things and got really into yoga, which, you know, doesn't change your underlying pattern of use. Of course, you know, you can do, you know, I was doing loads of yoga and, um, that doesn't change how you're using your body. It just, fixes your body every time you miss it. So I was in this pattern of breaking my body and fixing my body on a daily basis. You know, I'd play guitar and then I'd fix it. So at least I had the ability to fix it, which was great. So I didn't have any problems. But if I didn't do yoga and I played, you know, then I'd, I'd feel it pretty quickly. And, and I had this kind of distrust of playing as well because it felt like this is not good for you. you know? mm. Like this, this, this is not a good, this is not, it's not a really healthy thing. <laughs> <laughs> this playing guitar, you know, and I, I sort of, for a, for a while, I thought of it as something that, you know, is kind of best avoided because, you know, it was kind of one of those unhealthy things to do. Um, but I came across a, a lot of ideas and one of them was um, this wonderful writer from Japan who's writing in the 70s and 80s called Masanobu Fukuoka. And he he wrote a book called um, Natural Farming, uh, The Theory and Practice of the Green Philosophy. That's the book that I came came to first. There's a more famous one called The One Straw, one straw Revolution. So I came across uh, this book by Masanobu Fukuoka called uh, Natural Farming, The Theory and Practice of the Green Philosophy. And it's this beautiful description of uh, Fukuoka's farming techniques which was which he called do nothing farming and his idea was to look at what is the accepted principles of in his case japanese agriculture and see well we do this thing let's say it's plowing is it necessary can i not do it and he practiced this method for 40 or 50 years saying what less can i do you mm. know and that's really alexander right you know uh, if i'm picking up my guitar what less can i do so this kind of philosophy became really, you know, central for me. And I made a decision at some point to, you know, what, what do I do as, guitar, as a guitarist? I asked that question. And one of the things was I practiced. Uh, so I made a decision to stop practicing. And uh, I remember my, my friend Redmond in, in Ireland saying to me, yeah, well, it's all very well. You know, you can stop practicing and it'll be fine for a while because of the work that you did, that you've done. But, you know, eventually everything is going to fall apart. <laughs> and that is the kind of received knowledge. And this is, this is us talking, you know, I don't know, 15 years ago. So. Um, but the idea behind it was to really tap into, you know, a kind of playing that followed interest, that followed joy in music, that followed sound, and not this kind of idea that you beat yourself with you know okay i'm going to learn this whole piece now and i'm going to practice this much every day and i'm going to build it up slowly because at the end then i'm going to have this piece and i'm going to work out how to play it and then i'm going to play it to everyone in that way you know it was much more about ah what's what's happening today you know do i feel like playing and, and if so what and and letting things kind of spontaneously develop and so that's built over the years as a as a way as a way of working so if i go onto stage i don't i don't have a plan of this is what i'm going to play or this is the first piece i'm going to play or or this is uh um you know what i want to do at all I, i've mostly got able to be you know free of that compulsion to have a plan which is rather nice because then you can arrive on the stage you can sit down you can see the people there you can hear the sound uh, and you can play a note and you can, you know, you can go and you can start, you can start, you can start playing. And because I used to find that if I had a plan, 
halfway through the concert, I'd realized the plan was really getting in the way. It would really be, you know, and I'd kind of forced through, no, 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 but I wanted to play them this whole thing, you know, whatever it was. So that's how it all began. <laughs> I remember reading, what, because you studied violin quite seriously as a child, that at a certain point your teacher said, well, you maybe you'll have an orchestral career, not solo. And then you were yeah. thinking, well, I want to be by myself, right? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, that, yeah, the violin, it wasn't, I mean, it was, you know, you went to violin lessons once a week and then you didn't practice and then you went again. <laughs> it was more like that. And yeah. I went to live in the, in the middle of South Africa for a year when I was 10 mm -hmm. in the Karoo and they didn't have a violin teacher. And so I took up the piano. And by the time I got back to Cape Town and wanted to go to a secondary school that offered music as a subject, I wanted to do violin, but I couldn't even remember how to read. You know, I'd, like I'd lost it all, you know, a year and a half out in the desert and you've, it's gone. <laughs> so I had to kind of rehabilitate myself. And then I got really into it for a while, but I met this wonderful guitar teacher and yeah, you know, it's, it, it really worked out better for me. <laughs> yeah. But you recorded so much beautiful solo Bach, the violin uh, pieces, very beautiful recordings. Which brings me to your ethos of recording, Derek, because mm. you you um, love using reel to reel, and mostly you do one take or live recordings. I've noticed. Yeah, so the reel to reel is a new thing, and I'm okay. I'm, I'm I'm you know new as, as in a few years. Uh, I so I started off recording. I wanted to, you know I had this like I wanted to just hear the guitar, and I made some early recordings like that. We're using old ribbon mics. Um, I, you know, which are very beautiful. They have a lot of bottom resonance, but I was using really old ones, these BBC Coles things, quite dull. So the earlier recordings, are, you know, were very, you know, there was nothing extra there. Uh, very like, you know, you're hearing the guitar, no artificial reverb, no mm -hmm. equalization, nothing. Uh, then I, I met a guy called Howard Butcher who suggested to me, he said, you know, I like what you've been doing, but I think we could do something else. So I said, great, let's try it. And I put myself in someone else's hands for the first time. This was, you know, after doing five or six records in, in my own way, you know, not, not by myself. I was working with an engineer, but I was really kind of saying, this is what I want to do beforehand and not just saying, not pitching up. And, you know, so we did a recording called The Sound of Water, which was some of my compositions and some of Egberto Gismonti's compositions. And I was really like, oh, I was really excited by that, you know, and it's like fully, bam, you know, you're in that world of what, of what a microphone can actually do. Mm. And six months later, we did One Night on Earth. So, you know, that way of, um, that way of recording and using the studio I've been doing, you know, for the last 10 years or so, but I've still got this little, little bite that I want to, uh, that I'm inspired by the simplicity, the, a more simple approach. You know, Fukuoka said, I take my mandarin oranges, I pack them in unmarked boxes, I send them off to market and I get to bed early. <laughs> and I love that idea. And uh, so I got this Nagra, a reel-to-reel -reel recorder, which is one of the classic um, reel-to-reel -reel recorders that was used in all films because it was hardy enough to be able to, you know, you could sling it over your shoulder and run up a mountain in minus 20 degrees and it would still run beautifully. And it's got wonderful preamps made in the kind of late 70s, early 80s, my model, but originally from late, late 40s. Uh, so I got that and I'm trying to learn how to use it. And I've used it on the album you mentioned, Billy Goes to Durban. There are three tracks on there. And I've just finished this Bach mm -hmm. recording that I'm, well, not finished. I've just finished tracking it, which I went up to the, at Cedarburg again and, and made it. And it was a miserable experience. <laughs> you try to record and then the tape gets stuck and, you know, this happens and that happens or what does happen and, and I was really like, I'm never doing this again. And then I came home and I played it back and I really actually love it. And so I'm, I'm feeling inspired about mm -hmm. this really silly and difficult process again. <laughs> when I first listened to Billy Goes to Durban, I hadn't read the uh, the notes on. So I, I was a bit confused when I heard Billy Graham's voice in the stadium. Do you want to explain about that? Yeah, so I, um, so I got the tape. I, I needed tape. And I, I was given a box of old tape but, uh, and I didn't listen to it and got into the car and drove 15 hours to Durban or outside of Durban 
to work with a friend of mine called Guy Buttery, who's a wonderful steel string guitar player. And he hadn't seen the, the machine before. So he said, yeah, show me this thing. So we, we took out the first reel in the box and we put it on. And, you know, it's the tapes on the one reel and you pull it over to the, to the second reel. And we pressed play and it said, hello, welcome to Durban. Which was quite interesting because, you know, these, these things are from the 70s. They didn't have GPS. They didn't know I was in Durban. <laughs> so we carried on listening and it turned out to be a Billy Graham sermon, we realized pretty quickly. And then I did some research um, and apparently he came to South Africa in 1970 odd, 1973. And he did a huge uh, sermon in a, in a stadium in, in, in Durban to 70,000 people. Totally wild. So anyway, we, we recorded over that. And that's the, that's the record. Sorry, Billy. But you <laughs> but love you these little hear, bits. <laughs> yeah, you can still hear little bits. They're calling, um, they're calling Mrs. Burns to, to please come onto the stage at one point. And there's a choir. And yeah. there's a lovely announcement when he says, we're going to have a, this and that. And it's all very important. And I like that. So I kept little bits that, that bled through. Yeah. yeah. So your one night on earth, the, uh, the live recording you did 10 years later, I, it's so, uh, there's so expressive. It's so powerful and, and freer. It seems to me than the oh, initial thanks. recordings. Um, some people listening will know what a Cora is. I might've heard my interview with uh, Sophie Lukacs and her story, um, with the Cora, but for those people who have no idea and have never seen one, could you sort of go into that a bit, maybe play a bit of that music? Yeah, so I'm with you 100% if you don't know what the Cora is, because I'm from Cape Town and there's no Cora's in Cape Town. So 2002, I got given this record by, uh, a, well, I was given a record from a friend of mine. It was a copy, pirated CD, and it said, Kaira, K-A-I-R-A, and Tumani Diabate. And I knew nothing about either. And you know, in 2002, you didn't really jump onto Google and look things up. I, I didn't. So... I just put it in and I was blown away. It was the most wonderful thing in the world. Two or three people playing these minuscule, wonderful, kind of what sounded like perhaps nylon string instruments. I was just, wow. Okay. Then I heard, did some research, somehow found out that it was a solo record on an instrument called the Cora. And so that was, wow. Okay. So this is just one guy and he's, this bass line's going, but there's this internal counterpoint and then there's these improvisations on top and I just became obsessed with this record and listened to it nonstop for 10 years and uh, so it, the core it's that the instrument that it's played on is a big calabash and um, has a long uh, wooden neck and it has two lines of strings um, that are played kind of alternately you know one note one note one note and uh, I try to play the core I eventually got one into Cape Town uh, but then realized I didn't have it in me to really learn another instrument. But I had a wonderful few months trying to pick out things on it and from recordings or whatever. And then gave up the idea again. And then around 2011, I suddenly thought, well, what happens if I just think, you know, Tumani is actually a composer and I could actually transcribe this music from the recordings. And that had just never occurred to me. Uh, you know, the, the idea more was I thought it was a style of improvising. Um, but then when you start to really listen, you realize, no, 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 he's playing these melodies and they're coming back over and over. So I took the guitar, which is. So that's a standard tune guitar. And it's going to mean that if you want to hear these open strings in the chorus is a harp, you know, you're playing those 21 strings open, um, not as closed strings like on the guitar. Uh, you want to have that kind of feeling. And I, I just spent, uh, a year playing the Huela music, which is an old Renaissance Renaissance uh, lute. Uh, it's a guitar-shaped instrument, and it has this beautiful music. That was in my ear a little bit and I realized I thought if you were going to play this music you'd need like a 10 string guitar that had bass notes that you could keep because they'd have this bass note like bass line you know, so I thought okay if you want to have these crazy improvisations on top you're going to need to 
have those as open strings. But coming from the vihuela music, I realized somehow it all worked out. So I retuned the guitar. Many different ways first. So every piece had its own tuning. And then I realized that there was a chord tuning that you could play everything in there. So this is the first, uh, first chord piece I transcribed called Tubaka. So beautiful. And listeners should know they can buy the transcriptions you've written on your website. Yeah. So two things have happened with, with getting other people to play this music. Uh, one was I was always making the transcriptions. And so a lot of people played f from those scores. And I used a kind of modified tablature, um, which was what was used for guitar and lute music for many hundreds of years. And then around the 1800s, uh, guitarists started getting insecure and felt that they wanted to be real classical musicians. So they started tuning, they started using staff notation. And the problem with that was that the location of a note had to be fixed because there's an A on the page. It means you need to know that the A is on the second fret of the third string. Um, but the great thing about guitars is that you can change the tuning and then the A will suddenly be on the third fret of the third string, etc. And that's tricky if you've got a fixed notation system. The wonderful thing about tablature was that you could have any any tuning you liked mm -hmm. and the second fret was always the second fret because <laughs> that's what it tells you so i've kind of more and more gone gone towards um, that and that's how I, I do the chorus music and what's what that has meant is that many people who aren't classical guitarists can play the music you know if they because tablature is quite a lot easier to read um uh so there's those and then during COVID, i started a group online where I, I run these uh, group classes uh, a few times a week. It's probably there's probably about uh, often about nine a week between between six and nine a week. And they're each an hour, and it's a lead class. And the people who join can't be heard. You know, they they will mute it. So everyone can play. Everyone's playing with me, and I'm playing alone, <laughs> and guiding them through some process and it's been really wonderful i've met some of the greatest people through it all over the world and it's been such a brilliant thing for me in my practice uh just just it, you know it's so regular you've got the nine hours of the week where you've got to look in depth at mm -hmm. some things you know and we do a lot of the choral music we do a lot of bach uh, and then in every now and again we'll do something else like of a pat or Villa Lobos, but 80% of it is looking at the Tumani Mali uh, repertoire. Mm -hmm. I believe the Kronos Quartet has done a record, like arrangements based off of your arrangements for string quartet. Unfortunately, I missed them because they did uh, a recording with Tria De Cali, who I've also mm -hmm. played with. And they did a beautiful record with, with, with Tria De Cali. Uh, around about that time, I connected with him and I sent them an arrangement of Miniamba, which is a uh, Miniamba is a traditional song uh, from Mali, but uh, Tumani Diabate and Sidiki Diabate, his son, did a beautiful record together and they did a really crazy virtuosic version of that piece and so i i transcribed that for two guitars uh when john williams and i were doing um, some concerts together quite a few years ago 
and then from that made a string quartet uh, version of it and sent it to them. And they performed it, I know, at least at one concert in Turkey. Mm -hmm. But it was actually too hard. <laughs> it was really, it was really hard, and I, I would, I would do it differently now. Yeah, um, yeah. The uh, the online music economy's kind of changed our business, right? Like in terms oh, of s selling digital versions of things rather than albums. Mm, totally. Well, first of all, I always say I don't complain about this new reality because I'm from South Africa. So we never had a music industry really to speak of. <laughs> so, so, you know, I can understand how, you know, people in the US are like crying, you know, because, you know, they were making millions from selling records. We weren't. <laughs> so it's all good. Um, on the other hand, I love the cottage industry aspect of making my own records, printing them up myself, mm -hmm. making beautiful covers i used to i used to write these long liner notes and make these booklets um i loved that and i really i really do miss that you know there was this whole ceremony you made this recording and then you sat on it for a while and then finally you got it you know you got it all mixed up and then you'd make some sort of cover and you know it would just be this whole thing and that's gone uh, then we had another golden age around about the time I released One Night on Earth, which was 2012. Uh, that was the golden age of the digital download, which was an amazing time to be an independent musician because you could put your music, you could record your music and make a cover and then put it up online and people would buy it and you could actually make money and you didn't have to post anything. You didn't have to put up, you know, whole lots of hundreds or thousands of, of dollars for printing 500 copies because that was the most cost effective, you know, especially in South Africa. And I had these ways of printing albums where I only used litho presses. I'm really problematic that way. I actually, you know, as I'm speaking to you, I'm really hearing this. Uh, yeah, you know, there were simpler ways, but, you know, it, it, making much, it was a nightmare. Um, but I used to make these little, I used to have these generic cardboard covers and every album had a collection of rubber stamps. And so I'd print up the, I'd make the, the, the CDs would be burnt. Uh, or I'd, no, I had a, someone do it. So I'd get a spindle of the CDs and then I'd put them in the generic cover. And then I'd have a rubber stamp that would be Derek Gripper. And then I'd have a rubber stamp that would be the name of the album. And then I'd have a big rubber stamp that would be the track list at the back. And then I'd have the booklets printed up and they'd be glued inside this thing. And then later on, because I had a lot of records and they were all rubber stamps on the same generic brown cover, I started making little pictures, which I got printed up um, at, the, at the shops where they do the IDs, you know, the, the mm -hmm. passport photos. And I decoupaged them onto the front. <laughs> so so every, every album had its own little passport photo. And before a gig, I would sit there and I would just make up 50, 50 CDs and... You know, and then I started a record label and that's, and that's when I stopped making money from CDs and I printed up my whole catalog with these, you know, beautiful covers and, uh, you know, wonderful designs and booklets and that. And that was very satisfying and wonderful. But, you know, you have this huge outlay and you never make it back and they sit under your bed and some of them work and some of them don't. And, but the digital downloads, you didn't have that. You just put it up. And, you know, a week later, you could pay the studio guy that you owe for the studio time. I loved that. I really loved that. And then I read a book by this guy who was talking a lot about the digital economy and this, uh, you know, not creating paywalls. And I got very interested <laughs> looking now, looking back now, you realize how stupid and naive it is of the idea that the Internet things could be free. And that is the wonderful thing about the Internet. But unfortunately, you know, we are now give everything away for free to the benefit of the platforms that provide them. Mm. Where there was that moment where you could put your stuff up on Bandcamp and say, pay what you want, even nothing. And I loved that. That was great because you could see this organic growth, you know, and, and, and people did pay. And it, it was marvelous. You know, 70% of people would take it for free. 30% would pay a lot. And you'd sell way more. You'd, mm. you'd, you'd, you know, they'd have, you know, and it would get onto... You know, if we get onto like the top of the algorithms because there'd be so many downloads and it was really marvelous. Then that all died with streaming mm. and streaming became 
uh, yeah, then it was actually pointless to make an album and I stopped recording uh, because I just didn't really know, you know, why you couldn't sell CDs so easily. Uh, it all just became not too interesting. And then I, I've just, uh, re, uh, the last few years, been working with a wonderful label called Platoon. And they are supporting, you know, my recording in, in amazing ways and getting me onto streaming in a way that makes it work. Mm -hmm. And doing amazing things like record labels used to do, like paying for your studio time, you know, and, mm -hmm. you know, letting you explore things and supporting you in, in, in experimenting. Mm -hmm. so that's quite amazing they're like a new world old school record label mm -hmm. <laughs> um i'm curious to hear you talk a little bit about your montessori guitar method that you've developed yeah yeah uh, montessori so i had a bunch of children and being a guitarist uh you can't really afford to send you know four children to a montessori school um, because yeah, Montessori schools are all private schools. So, um, my wife at the time and I had the bad idea of training ourselves up as Montessori teachers and building a Montessori school in, in the house where we were, we were living on a kind of nature reserve in Cape Point. And so we got all the materials. We learned how to use them all. I did a course through a Canadian online thing well it wasn't really online because you had these huge files that they sent you it was you know a little bit pre everything being digital and had to do these exams and that and then i saw the miracle that is montessori it's quite amazing but i had this contrast because i was teaching uh, at two schools twice a week and it was so difficult to teach people to play guitar and it was so easy to teach these five-year-olds to do fractions so i thought there has to be a better way and because i was too full of ideas of guitar i thought that you had to use the montessori method to show them all the wonderful things that we've learned in guitar from phrasing to technique to finger position to this to that to blah blah blah, blah. so i had this huge complicated method of montessori which was as complicated as the whole of Montessori is because there's so much to the guitar. And slowly I whittled it down over a period of four years and realized that there was one presentation, you know, one group of presentations that you had to give and one way of teaching. And all the other things didn't need to be taught anymore because you didn't have this problem, you know, that, that was created through this over overstimulation, this fear reflex, because, you know, you get into the car and you've got to steer and press the brake and do the thing and you've never done it before and you've got to look left and right. Mm -hmm. And so, you you know, you go into flight mode and, and then, unfortunately, you succeed. So then your body goes, every time it sits in the car, it goes, okay, well, in order to succeed, I need to feel like this. And it brings about that level of tension again. And this is what we do you know, and so I started teaching these children. I had about 60 of them um, in, and and it was just amazing. It didn't matter who was walking in anymore. It, it, it was, you know, before it'd be like, oh God, it's the guy with the fish hands. You know, I'm going to be holding his body together for the next hour. You know, he's going to, his hands are going to, or there's this one who never does anything. Or, and it didn't matter anymore. It was all just wonderful to see them. Hi, because I knew that I could work with whoever they were, wherever they were. Mm. Um got to the point where it was too easy. You know, it was actually too easy to teach and I stopped teaching <laughs> because it was just too easy. It was like, oh, this is so great, you know, and they all played wonderfully. And I, I did a final um, test. I went into a Montessori school uh, twice a week and I just quietly did presentations to people in the, uh, in the middle of the class. And after a month and a half, there was the music class and, and they all got up and I sat in the audience with my children and about 15 of them got up and did this wonderful concert, one after the other. They made the order. They all played wonderfully. They didn't use music. Their phrasing was beautiful. And they'd only played for six weeks. And it was so nice to see. And you see this in Mali. You go to Mali and you see some nine-year-olds going crazy on the guitar. And they'll say, oh, yeah, he just picked it up last week, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um we can, you may not want to go here, but I wanted to ask you about a year of swimming because your liner notes are very obscure that you've gone through some really difficult personal stuff and it's a mm. really powerful album. Oh, thanks. 
Um, yeah, so I got, I got, uh, I separated from my wife at that mm. time. I think. Well, it wasn't actually then; it was before, but it was a long, difficult process. You know, you build a family with somebody and children, and and then you separate and you have to. So we shared. We carried on trying to homeschool, and we shared this process together. But that eventually, you know, didn't work, and it was terribly disruptive for everyone. And there was this horrendous process where we, you know, needed to find a, a new way forward. I have an aversion to official processes and paperwork and things like this. So there was a lot of that, a lot of lawyers, a lot of courts, and and I found it extremely stressful. And I was living with a friend of mine who's Canadian, actually. He was staying, well, he was living with me in my basement. He was a poet, you know, and you, you know, every now and again, you always have to shelter a poet in your basement if you can. That's what we have to do for poetry. <laughs> so I was sheltering a Canadian poet and he took me to the ocean and he said, come, we're going to, we're going to jump in. And it was so cold. I don't know if you know, the Cape Town Atlantic Ocean. We've got the Indian, which is a bit warmer on the one side of the peninsula. Mm. On the other side, the Atlantic freezing cold. I went in, it was like being attacked by knives. You know, it was just awful. But the next day it was better and we did this every day and then it became a thing. And for a year, I, um, pretty much every day, I was touring as well. And so I would, you know, do it in different places so that it obviously wouldn't be every day. But every day I was in Cape Town, I would drive over the over the mountain to this one particular little beach, um, which was surrounded by rocks. And I would spend at least 20 minutes or half an hour floating in the water and having a wonderful time. Uh, so that was where the, the title came. Okay. Wow. And also... Um... Your Alex Van Herden, you're very mm -hmm. close friends with. He was also your brother-in-law. Yes. Yeah. We married. And, we married sisters. Yeah. <laughs> such an incredible musician and such a tragic loss. Oh my gosh! I mean, I you know, I, every it, like it comes. I don't know if it's like a a thing. It comes in time periods. But now, when I was in the Cedarburg, I was really thinking about him a lot because he's really the the one musician that I felt you know that I could just we could sit together and we could create together in a way that I haven't really experienced. And, you know, I suppose it's being in your early 20s as well and discovering things afresh. So I, I can't attribute too much to the, you know, all of it to the connection that we had. But we had a great thing going and and we we made, a, it all started with a record called Sachtefle, which I played viola on. And we, we kind of made a string quartet and we wrote this music, which um, was dubbed Avant Fastrap, uh, which was Alex's passion was this music called the fast trap he played. He, he taught himself to play the accordion. He wanted to understand his Afrikaans roots. He'd come from more the Cape jazz side of music, but he, he wanted to understand, you know, the Afrikaans music and on both sides of the color divide, you know, the Afrikaans is, 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 a, is a language and a music that happens on both sides of the, of the, you know, artificial divide that was created in apartheid. And especially this is in the Western Cape. And so inspired by, you know, his knowledge of, of, of the, of this music and his kind of encyclopedic, uh, all these melodies would just flow out of him. And then I would bring these processes that I had in me from being in university for too long, uh, things from Messian or Steve Reich or, you know, Stravinsky. And I'd say, okay, well, there's this thing Steve Reich does called phasing where you take a melody and then, you know, two people play it at the same time and one speeds up and then it slowly changes. So Alex would provide the melody. And then we'd do that on, you know, and we'd, we'd phase that. And then we had a beautiful bass player called Bryden Bolton, who Alex had worked with since he was very young. Uh, and then we did an, we did another piece, uh, for a string quartet called the Santango Quartet. Uh, this was around, must be 2006 or something, 2000, something like that, uh, called Spure Bedi Bek van an Eisterparkhat, which means footprints at the mouth of an iron pig's hole. An iron pig is a porcupine. And this was inspired by a, a drawing in, it's a long story. Uh, and then we made a, reunion album 10 years after Sachtefle with Bryden we got together and we made an album uh, uh well we did a live recording and somebody came my friend Alex Bozes came to record it and thank goodness because two weeks later Alex was killed in a car accident and I chatted him on the phone before and he said you know keep the flame alive and all this and off he went and so luckily we had this this 
this recording of this performance of the three of us playing together. It's such a, a powerful recording, and I think any Miles Davis fans out there would really appreciate that recording. Ah, oh, thank you. Yeah, he, Alex, Alex was one of those truly just incredible musicians. The people people who can understand a language very quickly, who can pick up an accent very quickly, who can mm-hmm. connect with people in speech. You know, he spoke every type of Afrikaans and he would engage with people. And that's how he was with music. He didn't read music much, uh, and but he just had an incredible memory and ear and just mm-hmm. a beautiful sound. And, you know, it's just a wonderfully creative and always looking for you know, who was he? What is What music was he supposed to be playing? What is he supposed to be doing? Asking questions all the time. Mm. And your friend, um, Guy Buttery, you mentioned him before. Mm. I also enjoy that album. And he's playing sitar as well as steel string yeah. guitar. Yeah. Guy's, Guy is at, came up, uh, he, I think when he was around 19, he released an album and won a Sama Award, which is our big music award. And he's been on the road uh, in South Africa and all over the world, um, writing his own music, re- releasing beautiful records uh, uh, for many years now. And we have, you know, first I went to see him because I'd heard about this young guy, he's a bit younger than me, um, who was playing. I remember going to see him in some awful restaurant and he was playing electric sitar and it was really loud and honky and uh, and <laughs> that must have been, he must have been 20 or something. Um, and then he's re- released this beautiful record, which I really liked. And we started talking and we probably got put on the stage every now and again and played, uh, you know, or I'd guest on a gig, you know, yeah. something like that. And then that record that you heard was the first time we were actually sitting and doing a concert where it wasn't just half, half. And then we do something at the end. I think we probably did a lot of double bills, but we decided let's actually do a gig together. And then COVID happened, but we, we had the album, so we released the album, and now we, we're kind of getting it together. We we had a we we had a recording session booked, which is when I did Billy Goes to Durban. Mm-hmm. Um, Guy's father passed away, um, and so, well, was about to, and so he had to leave, and so I ended up recording by myself. And those are those three um, Nagra tracks there, and then he, he we were due to play in Cape Town, and and Guy got sick and couldn't make it. So we've had a lot of setbacks, but we we rebooked a, a tour in November uh, here in Cape Town, and I'm hoping to get us on the road a little bit as well, and to to really write some music together, like Alex and I used to do, uh, because often on these on the road uh, collaborations, you don't have that opportunity to sit together and really write music. It's about you know improvising together, like Deba Shish and I when we played together. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, it's, it's about surviving. <laughs> or, you know, you've got a little bit of time, but mostly it's improvised. And and certainly with the choro players like Yakuba Sissoko that I've played with, Zal Sissoko, you know, you, you're arriving, you have a common repertoire and you, and you improvise. So I, I really want to do that again. And so we're hoping that that's going to happen. Yeah. So now that you've started touring again after the lockdowns, I, I imagine South Africa was pretty pretty awful there was a lot of death and you you were really shut down for a long time you know we thought it was going to be awful and and like things were going to fall apart i think it's awful now for south africans you know in in the lower income brackets Mm -hmm. the the, the economic the economic ramifications of of covid have been huge so i think our real disaster is now Mm -hmm. um you know not to say that we didn't have a disaster during covid but it it wasn't it wasn't as bad as as everyone Mm -hmm. thought it was going to be uh i think our government did some weird things. They 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 responded in some kind of weird ways, but they were also great. And I think on a whole, it was actually managed pretty well. I mean, there are people who would totally disagree with me, like you know, you know, why weren't we allowed on beaches and that? But you know, they just they just did these blanket precautions, and mm-hmm. people who could afford to had the space could lock down, did, and it was enforced hugely. And people who couldn't, people in the townships weren't you know they weren't dragged dragged off the street and imprisoned you know it was like they 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 understood that there was this this difference that that not everybody could could do this isolating etc and people respected they you know they they respected the fact that this was here and everyone took precautions and i i think i think we did marvelously well really but mm-hmm. now i mean the economic thing was was hard and you can see that you can see the 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 repercussions 100% out on the streets. Mm-hmm. 
I wanted to ask you about the musician Madocini. I'm mm. probably saying her name wrong. No, you're saying it right. Okay. Madocini. Yeah, I mean, I'm not an expert on how to say it either. So. <laughs> well, I, I bought um, that album you put up on Bandcamp to support her mm. uh, during COVID, and it's it's really incredible. And I'd never heard that that style of music before. Yeah, she's amazing. Madocini is amazing. She's a force of nature, and she she plays a bow, uh, two bows. One is uhadi, which is a gourd resonated bow. You'd be familiar with the birumbau. So this is the ancestor of the birumbau. It would have come from Angola to Brazil. Uh, and then she also plays an instrument, which is kind of the baby version. It's called umkhube, and it's a mouth bow. So it's resonated with the mouth. And so I, I'm told that mostly the mouth bow is played by younger people, mm. like children, and then you grow up and you, you play Uhadi. But Madusini, uh, she had polio as a child, mm. and so I think she spent more time playing than most. And she is, I mean, I for me, um, her, her umkhube playing is, is is what you know drives me crazy. I just I love I love what she does, and no one can do that. And I've I've, I've transcribed one piece of hers, which is on that album from that album. Got like I wish you'd, you'd go on so beautiful actually I was um thinking about world music you know as a it's a beautiful thing but it's also used as a marketing label mm. you know what do you think about that yeah well I mean world music my feeling is world music you know as a as a genre out there in the world is kind of over you know you know there's still there's still other festivals and there's still other things but this this idea well you had various phases you had the discovery of so called world music in other words you know finding out that other people also played music and realizing that you know they which was interesting um, to have that on stages and you know mostly in the 1980s really where it really you know became popular and you know where we are now is we've got a lot of the festivals that are where were started back then and are now still going so there was that first moment uh, and then there was the second where it was about collaboration. Oh, wouldn't it be interesting to get a chorus player and a sitar player together? Oh, wouldn't it be interesting to get a jazz trumpeter and a, you know, and that happened. And of course, there were some amazing things that happened from that. I mean, one, this is actually a more recent one, which um, Baleke Sissoko and Vincent Sagal's uh, album called Chamber Music, which is chorus and cello. It's un beautiful. Um, but that is actually different because it's not oh, wouldn't it be interesting if it's two people who, who connected as people mm. and played together? And that's, I'm interested in, I, mm. you know, forever that must happen. Um, but this, you know, th this kind of became a programming thing of, oh, wouldn't it be interesting if we did this? And so you had a lot of collaborations created by outsiders and people kind of chucked together um, because it was, you know, great for funding and that. And of course, you know, lots of wonderful ensembles did come out of that. But I think... You know, the, the fascination of, oh, this person comes from 70 generations of chorus players or this person is this, that fascination. Um, the, the, the idea that you're getting access to the other, you know, you're going into this other world where, this, where the, the musician has never experienced the music that you know and you're going to enter into a new realm, you know, like the Beatles discovering Ravi Shankar. Wow, you know. But now we all have the same phones. We all have the same <laughs> YouTube accounts, you know, in, and of course the training and, you know, thing. But I, I think now it has to go back to finding the great music. You know, you can't just go, oh, I'm a, the lineage of this thing, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, um, and that, you can see that the interest is, is less just in the global interest. People aren't interested in that anymore. And I think that's fine, you know, just like we're probably not interested in the fact that someone is the fourth 
you know, generation from list, uh, you know, or something, you know, like it's, you know, we want to hear, you know, we're back to, we're back to the problem of now we have to, we have to listen to great music and your CV isn't going to, isn't going to persuade us. <laughs> yeah. And the idea of world music, obviously it's hugely problematic and, and ridiculous, but it, it comes, it comes at a moment in time when, uh, you know, record stores were full of jazz and classical and rock. And then they suddenly were like, oh, what do we do with the sitar album? Mm. You know, and someone came along and said, well, let's call it world music. And uh, de- I think it definitely in record stores, you know, like mm-hmm. wh- where do you put them? Oh, let's make a world music box and we can put the, you know, and Ravi Shankar was clever about that. He said, no, this is classical music. And he didn't get involved in that, in that uh, game. But, it, it, you know, and, and, and the music, I think, got uh, pushed in a particular direction um, through you know, obviously, you know, the, the countries that had the money to buy the music, you know, that had performing circuits, that had festival circuits, you know, South Africa is not one of those countries. Um, those countries that can buy the music define the music, um, and, you know, and so, and I think world music as we know it, like the, going to the World Music Festival came out of post-rock, it came out of people who were tired of the Rock Music Festival and thought, wow, what happens if we take the rock music festival and get like Ravi Shankar to play, you know, and then, and so it goes, but that means that you're, you're making a music very much for an outdoor party stage, mm. you know, and that means that you're going to get a certain type of music. And if you track Tumani Diabate's career, for example, he, he releases this beautiful album. He's 21. It's a solo Cora album. It is from, you know, it is the horror of its, of West African music. He is playing instrumental music of just the most incredible, uh, you know, virtuosity and, and melodic beauty and, you know, e- endless invention. Uh, it's like listening to Glenn Gould play the Goldberg variations and the trajectory of that in one world could have been that he just was in Bamako as a chorus player accompanying singers at weddings. It could have been that he was playing the concert halls of the world, uh, you know, on the same and the same bill as a classical pianist. And because we recognized, okay, well, the concert hall is a beautiful space to hear a piano. It's wonderful. It's got designed for this, for people to sit quietly and listen. And wouldn't it be amazing to put this core pair? And that has certainly happened with Tumani. But much more of what's happened is that, you know, he's looked at more bigger ensembles because if you want to headline a world music festival that's what you got to do and so you see that progression happening much more you know big big bands and you're mm-hmm. hearing you know and it it might not be you know because of this but there is that i've felt that myself you know is that you know be re- i've had to be really firm about saying no i can come and i can play your festival and i don't need another musician i can do it solo you know i don't need a trio no thank you you know and i've had to really fight against that and i've and i've you know, lost, you know, really movement and work as a result, mm-hmm. because, you know, when, once you're there, it's fine. Then everyone's like, oh, this is wonderful. We love this. But really, you're going to have a solo guitar or a solo chora on stage? Oh, I don't know. You know, <laughs> I'm, yeah. I'm curious, Derek, the show I heard um, you, I'm wondering if you always tend to do this now. It was very narrative and you kept playing while you were talking between every song that you just chose to to do is that sort of something you tend to do to sort of keep a yeah i've had this uh in as you've noticed i've got these kind of obs- like purist obsessions sometimes and one of them is like this conflict between um the pure musical experience unmediated by by speech mm-hmm. and i think from a montessori perspective for example if you're giving a presentation that is about color you don't speak because the brain has to split then, you know, and I mean, the world that we live in, wow, you know, she was saying this a hundred years ago, <laughs> yeah. you know, our brains are constantly split between, between media, um, you know, looking at the visual, hearing the audio, blah, 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 all this. So I think something happens to our minds when we hear music for an hour and we go out of the verbal. I think that's really important. Um, you know, Indian classical music is a wonderful example. Uh, but story and context is also very important. And we're in an age where there often 
music is stripped of all context and story. You know, you, you, there's not even liner notes anymore. There's barely an album. There's barely an album title. It's just got a bunch of songs all stuffed together on the internet, and they, you know, and you've got to hear them. So, so I think the story is important. And of course, for what I'm doing, there's there's lots of stories that are important, and that's become an important part of. But I didn't like how it broke. I used to like speak for a long time and then play and I didn't like how it broke. So lately I just carry on playing and talking at the same time. <laughs> that seems to solve that problem, which is what the griots were doing. You know, this music was in West Africa, the Kora, the, the griots were the, were the hereditary storytellers, musicians, matchmakers, peacemakers. And they, when they were speaking, would play the Kora, you know, whatever mm-hmm. instrument has an accompaniment. So maybe I'm copying them. It, it works very well. So you you do tour a lot when possible. And I'm curious if, like you mentioned a little bit about yoga before and Alexander Technique, if there's things you use for your physical and mental health while touring and dealing with jet lag and everything. Hmm. Um, Alexander, some of the principles of Alexander are very important to me. The main thing I, I rarely gain from, from him on a daily basis is the idea of inhibition. Inhibition is... is um, giving yourself permission to say no to to something, say no to a stimulus. <laughs> I mean, you know this. Uh, so, any kind of stressful situation is usually created by some kind of idea that you have about about what it is that you have to do or react. You know, so I've got to get on this plane on time, and my visa has to arrive, and this is super stressful. You know, that idea, my visa has to arrive on time. I'm going to France. Um, I'm going to the US now, and then I'm going to France, and I'm waiting for my European visa. And, you know, you get stressed out. You think, oh, but what happens if it doesn't arrive before, and I'm going to let down this, these people and blah, blah, blah. So from an Alexander point of view, you want to inhibit that. You want to inhibit that thought because it's creating a, a whole stress reaction. You know, so the inhibition of that thought would be, my visa doesn't need to arrive. You know, I don't, I don't need a visa. I don't need to play in France. I don't need to show up for those people who needed me to show up. Uh, this tour doesn't have to be a success and I don't have to leave my house. And this is not to say that those are the things that you're going to do. You know, it's just we're interested in the physiological reaction. Similarly with you playing a piece of music and you're halfway through and you start finding that you're going to have a memory lapse or you start stumbling. The first thought you're going to have is, I've got to remember this. I mustn't make a mistake. This is going to be a huge disaster. And you go into this whole thing and start sweating and going crazy and it all gets even worse. So then you just start inhibiting. I don't need to remember this. I don't need to play this piece properly. I don't need to, I don't need to get to the end. I don't need to make this audience happy. You know, whatever the thought is. So that's a very important, uh, that's a sort of pillar for me, mm-hmm. is uh, <laughs> internal internal resistance. <laughs> uh and then Alexander technique uh, in the physical sense, I'm usually fine. Uh, you know, I think it's it's done. It's done. You know, that inhibition thing does wonders for you physically as well, because if you're not in the fight or flight, um, your body is 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 in a much better uh, state. And then for me, a performance isn't an event any different to another. So I don't get myself stressed out and think I'm because I'm not going to. There's nothing, there's no way to succeed in a performance. Mm-hmm. I'm not thinking, I've got this piece. I really hope I get it right tonight. Come on, let's go. I'm just going and sitting there and I can do anything I want to. So it's really chilled, you know. <laughs> there's nothing There's nothing that can go wrong because the audience is on my side. I'm on their side. I'm not trying to prove anything to them, you know, in my head. Mm-hmm. Uh, so if I, if I make, if I forget something, I can talk to them about it. It's no problem. So that's not a stress. So traveling is usually fine. And then really the secret to to being super relaxed when you're traveling is to live with three children, to live with three teenagers. And when you go to the airport, you're not with them anymore. And you don't have to manage anybody's day-to-day existence or finding out who's got this or what or anything. So I, I find when I get to the airport, I, I get completely, I like my whole nervous system just relaxes. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and I can really chill and and touring is great you know you don't even have to make your own bed you never have to wash dishes it's wonderful yeah I, I relate about both of those things 
There's a, a piece you wrote, uh, the name escapes me at the moment. I, I heard you play it live as well when you were in New York and you missed your flight. I think it's, um, and then you were walking seeing the streets. Nobody. Yeah, seeing nobody. Would you be willing to play that for us today? For sure. So you persevered with a violin? Yes. Amazing. It's so hard. So beautiful. Thank you, Derek. I was thinking um, how you, um, you you were really became famous and I think your career took off because of your obsession with this griot music of the Chora. Do you ever think, well, what if that happened, hadn't happened, you know, in terms of your, your creativity and. It's interesting because you, you know, we're talking about this Alexander thing and body and stuff. Um, I also really, another thing I do actually uh, is I have a few body workers that I go to um, who, who work in different, very different ways. Uh, three, actually. I'm really lucky um, to have found these people. And one of them is or another Barry, uh, Barry Burkett. And he has this really uh, um, wonderful, interesting uh, way of kind of reading your body and checking, you know, through your body, you know, where the contradictions are. And he... Uh, really made me look at my musical ethos that had grown out of my work with Alex, which was, it's about here. My value as a musician is about the fact that I'm South African. Therefore, I have to be somehow referencing and working within that. Um, th so there were a lot of ideas like that that were shutting down uh, my ability to reach a wider audience and be out there, um, as well as personal things, you know, some young children and you know ideals about homeschooling all sorts of things like that uh and he and barry actually in the first session i went to him he really challenged me on that he was you know and he, he does it in this wonderful way because he's he's not he's, you're not telling him anything he's just going oh there's this thing you're supposed to be doing think of it and then you and then you're like oh yeah it's that um yeah but you're not doing that because why and then you keep thinking you know once he's only talking you're not talking back uh, but you are guided through eventually and you can see like, wow. And one of the things was like, you know, that my musical world is much larger than, than just the nationalism, you know, some kind of stupid nationalist idea that, you know, my value is because of where I was born. You know? So this, this idea, and I, and I suppose it's an idea that I keep struggling with, you know, like, uh, you know, the playing is enough, you know, like that the playing is enough. It doesn't have to be, you know, some fancy, Tech, tech, technology of recording or anything the playing is enough and uh, so that that moment 
of of realizing that was was when I realized I needed to be collaborating and engaging much more actively with other musicians. And the first moment of doing that was the transcriptions of Tumani's music. And you know, as as a musician, that wonderful thing of being able to engage with a musician that you love, with a composer that you love. You know, like I think we have a big value st- structure around originality and you know, people who write their own music, it's better and blah, blah, blah. But it's just the most marvelous thing to be able to sit inside someone else's musical world and explore it, you know, especially if they come from a different place like Bach. Wow. I mean, to spend an hour of your morning being inside that guy's head is just ridiculous, you know, like, and I would never want to give that up, you know, and, and, and I had given that up for a period of time. And so that moment of kind of discovering to money. And, and of course that just, that created a bridge, I think, to the rest of the world where the story I was telling was still very small. When I was here, I was talking about this music that was written in this very small place and I was keeping it small and just this, and that led to, you know, recording in a different way. So creating an album that sounded completely different and, you know, connected me to people like Lucy Duran, who had produced to albums and John Williams, who I'd been listening to for years and to play with him and then getting invited to a, a guitar festival called the Alnora Festival uh, by their, um, uh, what's the person who runs the festival? Uh, the festival director, David Spellman, uh, who knew some of the albums you were talking about, the earlier ones. And, you know, so that's that movement starting, but coming from this thing of opening up the music a little bit, a little bit more. Mm. Mm-hmm. And some people listening will definitely be guitar nerds and they might be interested. You played an unusual guitar early on. It was an eight string with an end pin. I was curious about yes. that. You see, this is the problem. <laughs> so, you know, at university, I learned that the guitar wasn't enough, that you had to do more, that it had to be more harmonically complex. The mm. music had to be this, blah, blah, blah. So I, and so Paul Galbraith, the Scottish guitarist uh, who invented this thing called the Brahms guitar, which is an eight string guitar and he played it upright to get a little bit more movement in the body and mm. various ideas. So I was very, very, uh, what's the word? I was just captivated by, he, he did a recording of the Sonatas and Partitas, a complete, you know, so it just was everything for me, you know, it was solo, it was a tour de force, you know, all the things that I kind of valued were in that record. Um, and so I had a, had a guitar like that built and, try to make it work. And I made one album on it called Blom Dorans, and I also try to learn Bach in that way on it. Um, but it, it wasn't a great instrument to play. It was very hard to play, not the eight string part, but the actual physical guitar that I had. Uh, so I eventually found uh, Herman Hauser, who became famous uh, for making Segovia's guitar um, in around the late ni- 1930s and managed to get hold of one by the grandson, Herman Hauser III, which is the guitar I'm still playing now. And so I had to give up this, this hope of, of grandiosity, uh, <laughs> which the eight string gave me um, for the more simple, uh, you know, for, for the real reality of an instrument that just worked, you know, mm-hmm. that absolutely just followed you and didn't, you know, and, and that there was also part of giving up practicing was just like, oh, I didn't have to work against an instrument anymore. So mm-hmm. play. So and- that was the eight string. Hmm. And it had a removable fret, like frets, fretboard? Ah, well, for a moment it had this. Uh, it ended up when I did Blom Durance, it was just a normal eight string. Uh, okay. We had like band frets. Oh, so we are talking to the guitar nerds, right? Yeah. Hi. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. May there always be guitar nerds because it is fun. Uh, I have like a few friends dotted around the world that I can like really go crazy and geek out about. And luckily we don't see each other too often. <laughs> One of them is Redmond O'Toole, who actually has continued playing this eight string guitar mm-hmm. and just did a performance of the Runwith guitar concerto on eight string guitar with the Dublin Philharmonic, I think. Uh, but anyway, that's a tangent. Um, so the movable frets uh, were as a result of, there was a period of about a year or two where I didn't have a guitar. I had ordered a guitar and I was waiting and so I thought too much and read too much and I was doing a master's in like a kind of interdisciplinary master's that I kind of designed myself because we didn't really have such a thing and I was really interested in this kind of interdisciplinary studies and all these 
things and how you know ideas mm-hmm. and so I was bringing together ideas from you know linguistics and I was reading Adorno and uh, this and that and all the old music theorists and right in the center is this book called The Genesis of the Music by the American uh, just intonation composer Harry Parch who had this idea you know of a new musical theory based in you know just intonation or pure tunings and I got very you know into this idea and constructed in my mind a whole universe of possibilities but of course you need an instrument and so the movable fret thing was tricky because you lost too much sound um, so I had a 31 tone equal temperament uh, fretboard made uh, the 31 tone equal temperament will give you up to the 11th overtone it'll give you in other words you can play in any key but instead of the five the fifth overtone which is what our system is based on you can get the seventh and the 11th which mm. which have a whole different kind of identity that is not represented in western music um there's uh but yeah, it's it's a complicated business, and I eventually had that thirty-one tone temper because you can imagine so many frets where they where they were twelve, they are now thirty-one. <laughs> uh, I, I took and then it, it it didn't it wouldn't work so structurally. It started the next started moving, so I just said, "Well, quickly, let's glue the let's glue the twelve one back." <laughs> yeah. So now I I I compromise by you know bending by tuning slightly differently by using alternate tunings by working in drones and just more with the back of my mind okay. rather than yeah yeah you had <laughs> played a little bit of Viluela music at the beginning did you ever try playing a lute at all or um, an oud I, I yeah I love the idea of both of them it's so it's such a pity when you play the, the lute you realize it's a completely different instrument you mm-hmm. know we're we're trained to be such like, so, you know, our hands are so, you know, over, over the top, you know, it's like a pianist, you know, that it's a big instrument and the guitar is actually a big instrument. The lute is so small and fragile and you play it and you realize, oh my goodness, this is a whole different thing. You've got to sort of touch it, you know, yeah. so it's kind of unsatisfying to play until you're used to it, you know, and Uda I've, I've played around with and obviously, you know, the microtonal thing would make, most sense uh, fretless but harmonic music you know that becomes difficult but yeah every now and again i go on these tangents i have a vena here but i'm much i'm re- i'm pretty much rehabilitated now to being a guitarist and i'm very really happy now i was a really reluctant guitarist for a long time i i thought it was terrible you know it just it didn't do what it was supposed to do it didn't have the same right range it was an equal temperament it was too soft it was too this it was too that blah 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 um, now I think it's great. <laughs> <laughs> um, to close this out, do you have any advice you would give for musicians coming up, starting their careers? No. <laughs> I have no clue because it's so crazy out there. You know, I, I would have said 10 years ago, I would have had a million things to tell people. Okay. Like, you know, like I was talking about the pay what you want model and how to use the internet and that. But uh, now it's so it's so perplexing. The whole thing is so strange, uh, and I don't really understand it. And so, I think the you know if there's any value in music, it's the fact that music has a value. And the point that and in order for it to have a value, we have to spend time doing it. And all the things that they tell you that we're supposed to do, like keep an Instagram account and blog every five seconds of what you're doing and have everything on video and record everything on your phone and remember everything this and check out every possible version of this thing that you've done and blah, 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 and listen to 20 versions on YouTube. It's all a lot of noise and it all means that you've got much less time to play. And one of the wonderful things about coming into music in the 90s in South Africa was that... I couldn't even get like a lot of recordings easily. You know, you had like the top 20 stuff, but you didn't, you couldn't get, you couldn't like get a Tumani Diabate recording. You couldn't download it on the internet. You couldn't get a score that you wanted very easily. You had to make do with the, with the library at the university and the records that they had there, which which were 20 years old. And that was actually great. You know, it was great because it meant that you didn't have too much input because you don't actually need that as much input as we have you know like it's enough to meet a guy on the road having him say something really incredible that can change your life and you can remember that forever but now we meet someone on the road every 15 seconds with a brilliant idea 
it's it's too much you know so i i i would like to see that we you know we've explored this now this digital reality and how we can connect to people it's largely being taken away now you know if you want if you want that you know social media to work for you it can in a miracle you can have these you know miraculous things but most of the time it's you have to pay for it and you have to spend a lot of time you have to feed the algorithm with your attention and i feel that we just need to feed feed our instruments with our attention and and just you know there's a kind of an energetic thing that happens with music i think and things seem to work out you know if the music is going and i find that if 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 i feel like my career career is dying and things are not looking good and it's all going to come to pieces and i'm going to have to get a job um it's usually just because the music isn't going well and if i forget about it that's the inhibition again uh and go back to playing and get inspired by playing then suddenly i i realized like hey man, i've got this great idea i should call this person and then that person says yeah you should come and play my festival and before you know it something's happening again but that connection with the people that make things happen only happens if you're inspired about music if you're not they're not interested and it doesn't matter how many times you post what, what fabulous things you do <laughs> nobody cares <laughs> And you only well, become interested by doing it. Sorry. Yeah. You know. No, thanks for your wisdom. That's actually fabulous um, advice, I think, for everybody, not just um, professional musicians. Although that's a whole discussion. What is a professional versus amateur, which is a, mm. a bad divide that, you know, we still totally. don't use that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thanks so much for your, your time today, Derek. It was really wonderful. Yeah. Thank you, Lee. That was really, it was really great. It's always, it's, it's, it's really nice to speak to somebody <laughs> and, to, and just, just to map it out again, you know, and to be reminded of things. It, 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 I think it does something really good. It's always a very good for me when people do this for me, because sometimes I forget what it is, all the, you know, you forget the parts and how things fit together and, and you forget what you're supposed to be doing. So thanks. <laughs> <laughs> My life is so enriched by getting to know these incredibly inspiring creative guests and their perspectives on their lives and music. Please follow this podcast and sign up for my podcast newsletter to get sneak peeks for upcoming guests and find out about newly published transcripts.